ever causes me is what people should call me. Because oh. I personally, it's my personal opinion that I don't like the term chairman um, and other people do. So I won, at one point I did cause a bit of an argument in the United Synagogue Chairs WhatsApp group when I broke it to the mainly male group that I would rather be referred to as chair, at which point some of the male chairs sort of all started piling in and saying, well, we think the term's chairman, at which point I think I then probably burnt my bridges forever when I said, well, to be honest, I think it's up to me as the female in the group to decide how I want to be referred to, if you don't mind, and I don't think I've made many friends, but, oh, but within our own community, no issues at all, no problems. No, no, I think we could have a long conversation about the need for them to call themselves a chairman, but we won't, we'll stop there. <laughs> I think also considering your role, it's hard to ignore the challenges of the last year and the extra um, pressure that's put on you. How to manage, how you've managed the shul, how the shul has been managed during COVID uh, in a remote and yet a very connected way. People seem to have got resources mobilised very quickly last March. And I know you took a leading role in this. Would you like to say a bit about that, the shock of that and how that was? Yeah, I mean, the first thing to do was kind of how did we, how did we get through? How did we mobilise? And there's one very simple answer, which is teamwork. I mean, it very much was not me. You know, it's been very, very much a year of, we were a very good team. The, the uh, honorary officers and the rabbi, we all work really, really closely together. Um, and I think we all realised immediately last year that we needed to respond fairly quick. You know, it was a totally unprecedented situation, obviously. You know, to shut the doors of our shul was yes. just unheard of. But I think the rabbi and I both felt that our initial response was about welfare. We both wanted to know that everybody was OK. Um, and we very, I think what's made a real difference, I think, is just um, the use of the Internet. You're having two key things, really, WhatsApp and Zoom. You know, we, the first thing we did was set up a big WhatsApp volunteer group and we've that's kind of kept us going through the year really. We know that anyone that needs food has had it, anyone that needs to chat to someone has had it. Um, and then Zoom has just been the way we've all connected through the last year and it's really, really been, you know, special really. Yes, so you're feeling a little bit more relaxed about it as the year went on. And of course, shoe opening now and things looking brighter, hopefully, good. Hope. Yeah. Karen, of course, does have a life outside shoe. 10 years ago, she set up her own consultancy, Media Stories. Um, and this is a consultancy which advises charities and other non-profit making organizations in how to tell their story through the use of the media. She's going to return to this role in April after a break from it of six months. At the moment, since September, 2020, she's been a director of marketing and communications at Jewish Care, a full-time role, which is, I think, a first since you've had your family, Karen, I'm wondering what sort of an adjustment was that? Also, you're used to being your own boss and perhaps that was a bit different as well. Sure, definitely. As you said, it's the first time I've worked full time in, in 20 years. Um, but I think it's been made possible because of all working at home. So to be honest, the whole world is now kind of working how I've worked for the last 10 years, which is, you know, my day, I don't sit down at nine and finish at five. You know, I might choose to take the dog for a walk in the middle of the day. I might put my chicken soup on halfway through the day on a Thursday, but then I might be reading emails at midnight. You know, everything is very kind of jumbled up and I make it work mm. however it kind of works for me. Um, but it has been, it definitely was challenging at the beginning to go back to just being expected to be kind of on call for one particular organization the whole time. Like, but I've really enjoyed it. It's been a really, I think it was a good time to have a bit more of a work challenge because obviously there's nothing else to do. Mm. So, you know, yeah. I've thrown myself into work the last six months. Yes, oh, good for you but you'll be back, back at Media Stories quite shortly. Sure. Karen is fundamentally a family person, having been born into a large extended family, most of whom I think are here with us tonight. And she's always enjoyed all the benefits that that can bring. Living then in her early days in Chigwell, and now after marrying Warren Taylor in 1996, enjoying with pride her three children, Nathan, Noah and Aaron. She describes herself as creating, she and Warren as creating their own model of continuity now. They share a great love of Israel and enjoy spending time at their home there. Karen's parents, Philippa and Lawrence, are now well-established members of our shul. She grew up with an older and younger brother, and she said this toughened her up having to manage all the banter in the family and the humor that brought. And I noticed the configuration of your own family is exactly the same. 
And I was thinking about how you must identify with Noah as the rose between two thorns. I don't know whether you <laughs> thought about that. We definitely think about it. No, it's definitely, I mean, it definitely rings true. Like not just the same configuration, but the age gap is exactly the same between my brother, Steve, and my brother, Richard, and right. Nathan, Noah, and Aaron. And Noah is, we'll talk about this probably more later, but she's very much a chip off the block. She's very much like me. And I think yes. that could be about being a sister between two brothers. I don't know. Although Noah doesn't know. Her brothers are very different to my brothers. Growing <laughs> up in my house, she's got a very gentle, lovely older brother. And my brother, older brother is also lovely, yes. but a very different character. Right. She's got an easier ride. <laughs> Karen describes herself as a whizzy wig and goes and those of us who know what that means, that is what you see is what you get. <laughs> I was wondering Before what you mean. <laughs> is totally true to herself. Her capacity to man manage demanding roles both within the community and it's also as part of a large family takes some doing. And she says this is enhanced by two main concepts, her capacity to delegate and include and empower others where appropriate and her idea that we should strive to be good enough whatever she and whatever we undertake and this is what she does so she doesn't torment herself with striving for perfection or needing to micromanage others for everything to be perfect a very healthy and liberating approach to life you say you've learned a great deal from being chair of the shul what would you say you've learned mostly Karen? i think the two biggest lessons i've learned is to try and understand things from other people's perspectives. You know, not everybody sees the world in the same way. And I think I've learned a lot over the last four or five years about empathy and understanding things from other people's perspectives. And that helps, therefore, I think once you get that understanding, it then helps you bring people along with you on a journey. And I think those are, that's one thing. And then the other thing is just a skill. My mom would be the first to tell you that it took me quite a long time to learn to bite my tongue when people say things that I may not agree with. And I've learned a lot about diplomacy, don't always respond to everything. Don't respond by email until you've had time to think about things. And it's just a lot, I think, yeah, about diplomacy and understanding of other people's opinions. Very good advice. I wish I had learned it. Very good advice. You describe yourself as more of a very social being. You enjoy the theatre, cinema, the whole London scene, and of course, cooking and entertaining friends. And I know that you're already planning a big celebration in September to mark a very special birthday. <laughs> yeah, and my 50th. 50th and looking forward to celebrating that with family and friends now down to business Karen how does the idea of being cast away appeal to you not in the slightest <laughs> I know when you asked me this I said to you it literally horrifies me like I don't mind my own company sometimes but if I was always on my own I, I said to Warren earlier it reminds me of that film Castaway when Tom Hanks had to talk to the ball I you know I would literally be turning the coconuts into my friends and talking to them. I'm the kind of person that I can't, Warren knows this, everything that's in my head, I say it out loud. I have to talk everything through all the time. Greg, my friend Greg, who's probably on this call, told me once, there's two types of people. One who will tell you, talk through a menu and tell you everything they're thinking, shall I have this, shall I have that? And the other one who kind of is just all in their head. And I say everything out loud. So I will be talking to the trees, the, you know, the birds, whatever, on the, on the island. Oh, well, you'll have a lovely audience. You'll be great <laughs> friends by the end of the trip. And I just wondered, how was it for you choosing? How did you choose the music? Was it tricky or how did it, how did you manage? Um, some leapt out immediately, like we'll see as we go through. There are some songs that just, I knew within, you know, five minutes of Warren asking me to do this, that I would be picking X, Y, and Z song. The hardest thing is get. I think everybody always says this, is getting it down to eight. And I could have had another five or six or, you know, it, it's always hard, but I tried to choose then maybe not my eight favourite songs in the world, but they're eight songs that reflect certain bits of my life or certain you know, things I like to remember. Lovely. Well, we're looking forward to hearing them. And we're going to start now with your first piece of music. Do you want to tell us what it is first? Sure. And why so, you chose so, so as you alluded to, I come from a very big family. My mum is one of five sisters. My dad is one of four brothers. We're all very, very close. We grew up as a gang, basically, a gang of cousins. And I, my aunties and you know, I had a very strong kind of maternal role models from my grandma and then my aunties and my cousins we have a big party we have a lot you know, we love a family symphony we all love to dance and whenever this song plays we all jump on the dance floor together and we all hug each other and dance and we're looking i'm really looking forward to getting like the first simcha back after this experience and we all can dance again to this song 
Oh, that's lovely. Well, we look forward to everybody on their feet from Karen's family. And thank you, Paul, perhaps the first piece of music, which is We Are Family by Sister Sledge. Desert Island Dis, I just want to hear more. And it was wonderful to see the family, Karen. Great idea to show the photos. Absolutely lovely. Lauren Laverne's got a lot to look forward to and learn. Now we move on to your second piece of music and you talking about your secondary school life because your, your early days are sort of in Chigwell and then you move out of the community you go into the big city don't you to the city of london school for girls and of course then you move to a, an all-girls school which i suppose is very different and especially you have not been in an all-girls family so how was that for you and what are you going to oh are you muted right That's sorry it. i put myself on mute during the music i won't do that again obviously that caused a problem um Sorry, so the, I was slightly unfocused because I was panicking about being muted. Okay, you're asking about all right, school. I was asking about you going to secondary school, going to an all-girls school. Right, I right, come right. from a mixed gender family, and how was it going to the city of London yeah. school for girls? It was fabulous. It was a great school. I think it still is, is my understanding. Um, it it did feel great to be in a kind of female-only space. I think I, I do like the company of women. I've got very close girlfriends. I've got you know I I think I do kind of thrive in that space. Um, and C city was a kind of school where although it was a girls school and it you know it was quite a while back they were very kind of modern thinking they they always led you to believe that you could have a you should and could have a great career and you could kind of be whatever you wanted to be um it was a, I think it was a very nurturing school I really enjoyed it it was good good and they made you feel anything was possible exactly good and it was hopefully do you want to, you want to tell us about your next piece of music now sure. which is wham wham or you tell us anyway I'll tell you but um, though, you know, those who know me well will know that at this time in my life, in the early 80s, Wham! was a very big influence on me. I absolutely love Wham! Big, big fan. Uh, I used to go to school in the morning and in the old days we still had blackboards and the whole of one wall was a, was big blackboards. And I used to go to the far side, like the teachers used the middle bit. I used to go to the far left side and I would just literally write the words of Wham! songs up on the board every morning and just leave them there. And then the other pupils would sit through their lessons and they could enjoy the songs I'd written up on the board. And it's, um, it's a running joke in my family that um, when Careless Whisper used to come on the telly, I used to burst into tears because I knew that I'd never get to meet George Michael. And that made me very sad. And I never will now, sadly. Obviously, I, mean, I was still devastated when my brother told me that when the day he died, I was genuinely devastated. Yes. And our dog, George, is in fact named after his middle name is oh, Michael. A very he, he is named in honour of George Michael. So I, I could have chosen any Wham song. I mean, obviously there was quite a lot, but I thought I'd go for one of the early numbers, which kind of reflects this time of my life. So it's Wham Rap is the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Wham Rap, please. <laughs> Get, get, get on down, said I get, get, get on down. I said I get, get, get on down. I 
My little brother Richard and me, and um, one of my other my other brother just texted me to say how much that looks like Nathan, me in that picture. Well, I was actually wondering whether you and your family might be getting confused with it, which generation you were uh, were being photographed. <laughs> so, a good experience for you at City of London. Yeah, very and happy. Then the starting of independence, wasn't it? And of course, another sign of independence at that time of life was joining a youth movement. And for you, I know, along with others in the community, that it really was a very pivotal moment for you. The world opened up very differently and, of course, took you, made you, brought you into contact with people who weren't just from London, for one thing, but just opened up a whole new world. Would you like to tell us about the starting of your Habonim career, which we sure. didn't record? Sure. So I've been, in, I've been involved in sort of various youth groups growing up. I went to the local club in Barkingside. And I'd gone to the JLGB um, and I think I realised quite quickly th this was not for me. I went to one weekend with JLGB and I remember getting, you know, I was probably a bit cheeky when I was a kid, but like my son Aaron is now and my brother Richard, you know, we're cheeky, we like to say what we're thinking. And I just remember one of the sergeants or whatever they called themselves then made me wash up all these pans because I, I don't think I would have been very naughty. I'm not a naughty person, but I maybe said something cheeky. And so JLGB was not for me. But then I discovered Habonim and suddenly it was full of all these kind of, um, you know, cool kids with long hair and ripped jeans and nobody was getting cross with you if you were cheeky you know you were encouraged to be a bit a bit off the you know a bit different a bit anarchic a little, we thought we were very cool very you know different um and I just felt like I'd found my place you know I loved up and I loved everything I learned I learned then the, the first camp I went to was when I was 15 it was in Holland and it was called Sirem they still run it now the same camp and what I found incredible is it the experience I'd had up to this point of kind of Jewish youth movements was just you know fun discos but Habonim was in formal education I mean that camp in Holland the theme amazingly for a kid's summer camp was about the holocaust but it was still like the most incredible and fun experience even though it's such a serious topic mm -hmm. I think Habonim is and not all the youth movements are brilliant at kind of taking quite a serious topics and helping young people understand them and just creating an amazing kind of safe space for, for kids to grow up and discover mm -hmm. new things. Mm -hmm. so. And then, of course, being part of Habonim uh, informed your schnapp year at the end of school, didn't it? And took you to Russia Nikra? Exactly. Yeah. So after school, um, in those days, every you know, it was just kind of the done thing in Habonim. You took a year off. We all went um, on what was called Shnat Hashara, as you said. I spent the first four months in Jerusalem um, on a youth leadership programme. And then the second half of the year was, as you said, on, on Kibbutz Russia Nikra. Um, and I made friends for life. I mean... I think four or five of my Schnuck group are now communal community members. One is your daughter, Vicky, obviously. Uh, you know, we're all close friends. It's more than 30 years old. We've, our Schnuck WhatsApp group is buzzing at the moment because everyone's turning 50 this year. So we're all chatting all the time. Um, do you want me to talk about the song here? Should I tell you about the, the song? Yeah. So the song I've chosen here is a song that reflects that. It's um, by an Israeli singer, Mati Kaspi. And we learned this as part of our Orpan. We learned this song because it's very easy words in Hebrew. It's called... Um, Yeshli, Eretz, Tropic Yafa. And I chose it because the words of the song are all about, I've got this beautiful tropical country. And he talks about the sun and the um, playing football. And these are all things that kind of reminded me of, of my Shnut year. But the one thing that will always stand out for me, we, we lived um, uh, on Russian Akram, as I said, on the, and it's a beautiful kibbutz. It's in the north, right on the edge by Lebanon with the sea on one side and the mountains on the other side. And I always remember when we would come back to our fairly slummy rooms at the end of the day, which are not very nice, you would have this beautiful view of the sun setting over the ocean and that what this song will always remind me of that stunning view of our kibbutz and I'm just going to say by the way in this song you're going to see a picture 
have a look. Two of the, one of the people is me, the other two are, is, are people that everyone here will know and I'll, I'll tell you who they are afterwards, but have a look. Paul's going to pause there so everyone can just see that picture. I don't know if anyone's guessed who it is yet, but I'm the one on the far right. And then the tall fellow in the stripe is Greg Swimer. And in the middle is our esteemed CST leader, Dave Rich, in his earlier years. So that's the three of us on Schnapp. <laughs> great. That's great. Thanks, Karen. And lovely to see our esteemed members more elderly now. Right. So your world has opened up. And then, of course, School finishes and you move miraculously out of London, up north to Manchester. Bit of a shock, or maybe you had been up there, I don't know. But of course you had your elder brother there, didn't you, already? And he paved the way for you to start at Manchester University. Uh, you studied English and American studies. And um, although you do say that studies weren't your priority while you were there, can you tell us perhaps what was your priority? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair to say that um, I think I said to you when we had our pre-chat that I think I reached my academic peak at school and I'm not sure I ever quite got there again. University wasn't about the academic side. I enjoyed my course. English was fine, but, you know, there was a lot of read. You had to read a lot of books. I, do. I, was too busy. I didn't have time for all the books. Nobody told me you had to read that many books. <laughs> so um, what I did focus on, though, was, you know, I knew pretty much from sixth form at school that I wanted to have a career in the media. I was involved in school in magazines and things. And as soon as I got to Manchester, it was literally like the doors just opened and I got involved in the student newspaper, like literally within the first few months, I think I went and introduced myself. Um, and then my brother was very involved in setting up a student radio station and I got involved in that. Um, so I was a radio presenter at university. Um, so you actually presented a programme, did you? It's only a student radio, but yeah, yeah, it was, yes. it was good fun. I think they'd never had a student radio station before. It was all quite new in those days. Um, and then, so I wasn't really doing very much studying. But then in my third year, um, it was also very lucky being in Manchester because that's when, when they launched uh, Radio 5 Live. They launched it in Manchester um, when I was a student. And they had a student, they, they had a student show called Hit the North. Um, and my brother, again, I was very lucky to have my brother. He was very helpful. He had got some work, I think, at Radio 5 Live, and he introduced me to the producer. And I became sort of like a student correspondent kind of things. But while I was in my third year, I was really not thinking about my finals. I was making uh, radio packages for Radio 5 Live, doing paid work already. Mm -hmm. So I was very excited. It was, that was more what my focus was. So I, I did find I, I got my degree. Don't nobody panic. I didn't fail or anything, but, <laughs> but I didn't degree really. No, you were very into communication by the sounds of things, weren't you? It was really your your metier to be a communicator. And it sounds as though you started yeah, early exactly. on with that. Exactly. Absolutely, yeah. And now we're going to have your next record, which you'll tell us a little about about 
but that this one um, the time I was in Manchester was an re- amazing time to be there it was kind of the early 90s and it was the time that people talk about they call it Manchester because the music was all happening in Manchester it was really kind of the scene was really happening um, and there were a couple of big bands that were kind of really known at that time from Manchester and one of whom um, one band was the Happy Mondays and I've just got a very clear memory of me and my brother we had our little Persia that we used to drive up to Manchester in and I just have a very clear memory of us driving up to Manchester, car so loaded you couldn't see out the back. I mean, it was only a little car, I don't even know how we did it now, both of us. And we're shouting out the window, twisting my melon man, which is you're here in this song, is one of the lyrics of this song by the Happy Monday, Step On. So that's why I chose, chose this. laughing is the, the chat on my family whatsapp group is hilarious at the moment i think my brother's quite enjoying that he's kind of co-starring in this oh, everybody's got something to say i was only thinking about it the way you seem to have transferred so easily from this huge very secure family base onto different stages of your life without any problem you seem to settle very well wherever you went would that be fair to say um yeah i think that is fair i think i was very lucky because you know, going on schnapp wasn't really like going into the wide world. I was with friends and, you know, mm. in Israel in a close group. Going to Manchester was also quite safe. You know, so mm. my brother was there. There was a lot of other Jewish kids. It all felt, each step felt quite safe, I think. Yeah. Um, and actually, in a way, the next step after that was when I went to my, I did a postgraduate in Cardiff. Cardiff, yes. And that almost actually felt like the first time that I was in a slightly kind of alien world. It was, I did a postgraduate in journalism. And I remember when I started just feeling, I think I was a bit knocked back because I didn't get a great degree. And I think, I remember thinking, everyone here is going to be brilliant. They're all so much cleverer than me. And I, I remember being quite upset when I started that I thought like I was out of my depth in a way. Right, right. Um, but I think I see I think you, this was your chosen course. Was This was really something that was going to send you out into your chosen career, yeah. wasn't it? So. Yeah. Maybe that's helped you, that helped you manage it as well, even if it did feel a bit strange. And of course, something else helped you manage the time when you were in Cardiff, if I'm not mistaken. And that was a very important stage of your life when you met your Warren. Warren. Not, not Warren Weiss, obviously, who's, who's behind the scenes producing yeah. this, but Warren Taylor. <laughs> um, so you saw the picture there of Warren, obviously, just come up at the end of that other song. Yes. And did you, where did you meet him? And was it love at first sight? <clears throat> Did you know him at all before? So Yeah, so we knew each other, again, this is how influential Harbonim was in my life. We were both in Harbonim. Um, so I knew Warren since I was about 15 or 16 in Harbonim. Um, but in the kind of Harbonim world, he was four, or so he's four years older than me. So that's quite, a, mm-hmm. you know, he was a leader that I was looking up to and esteemed, you know, Madrid that you know, everybody loved and I loved, obviously. Um, but we really got to know each other properly when I was um, in my third year at Manchester and then going to Cardiff. Uh, we started going out he so he'd finished university and he'd come back we lived near each other so we also knew each other from the area i live in chigua he lived in gants hill which is very close redbridge so we knew each other growing up he'd come back to london because he'd finished his degree um and he was working um for the parliamentary war crimes group he was involved in the kind of early foundation of the holocaust educational trust and the war crimes bill 
and he finished that piece of work and he was just waiting for his legal career to start he'd applied for law school so he was back living at home mm. so when I came home just after my third year just in the middle of the holidays of my third year we, we got to know each other and we started going out um and I realized I think the one thing that I realized almost immediately that this was someone quite special was um my grandma died just during my finals which was obviously not also was I, I claim as well and I'm sure this is right this is one of the reasons why I also didn't do as well as I could have done in my finals and my grandma died right in the middle of my finals which was obviously not not easy mm. but Warren came and I came back we would only been going out a month maybe six weeks and he came to the funeral and the shiver of my grandma and I remember you know he came in and he was faced with all this family this incredibly close family he didn't know anybody obviously he came to the shiver and I just remember thinking this is someone who's going to be there for me you know? Oh, and you were right. Sorry, I'm going to get emotional. Sure. I've the fun stuff, we now I'm going to get emotional. We knew we'd have a bit of emotions along the way. Well, how lovely to recall it with that emotion. And you were right about him, weren't you? And it was, sure. you married in 1996, mm -hmm. very happily. And of course, you have the three children that we've talked about. Um, and you've chosen a piece of music to remind you of that special feeling. For sure. So I have to be honest, there were there were two choices here for my kind of Warren song. I couldn't quite decide. We, we always joke that our kind of our song, our joke song is Bette Midler, The Wind Beneath My Wings. I don't know if anyone knows that song. It's from the movie um, Beaches. Beaches. Because the, it's kind of a joke, but it's also kind of serious because the words of that song are all about you were there and you were the wind beneath you. And I'm, I am the front guy, you know, I'm the loud one, but it's Warren who's kind of, oh. who is the wind beneath my wings. Yeah. I think it's really true. But that's not the song I chose because <laughs> it's a bit of a comedy song. So what I actually chose is also a really beautiful song. It was the it was the first song at our wedding, and it's Van Morrison. Have I told you lately that I love you? And it, it's not his really choice. Good. choice of music Karen thank making you. us all emotional really <laughs> lovely thank you so you're settled with Warren and now the time starts for your actually for your career really to take off doesn't it you had all these hopes and things did go from strength to strength didn't they do you want to tell us a bit about how it started you wanted always to work in children's television didn't you yeah so my ambition was always to work in children's television the course I was on in Cardiff was quite a kind of prestigious broadcast journalism course and all the rest of them wanted to be kind of world-class news correspondents and actually to be fair some of them are there's a woman called Vicky Young that was on my course she's now the BBC correspondent political correspondent there's another guy Damien Grammatica so I think is a world correspondent they were all on my course loads of them yeah. and it was never for me I always wanted to work in children's television mm -hmm. um, and when I left I was very lucky in that um, I was already work I had some paid work freelancing for the BBC I've already had this work from Rape Five Live and I got some more radio work and then in those days, the place for TV and radio jobs was the Media Guardian. And then I saw an advert for a junior researcher job for a program called The Time Place at Anglia Television. It's kind of chat show. And I just applied, you know, just applied for a cold job in the newspaper. And I was incredibly lucky, I think, to get a job 
just from an advert, I did get the job. Um, and that was the kind of like, once you got that first step, you're kind of yes. you're in, really. So I got very lucky, I got my first step. I stayed there for a couple of years. And then I moved to Channel 4 to the show, The Big Breakfast. That was Channel 4's kind of big breakfast show at the time, um, which was an incredible training ground. I mean, loads of my friends now who work in television, a lot of people came through that kind of training ground of the, of the company that made The Big Breakfast. My other brother, Richard, also worked there at one point, The Big Breakfast. He's now a very successful television producer. And, you know, he definitely, that training ground really kind of helps people move on. Yeah. I mean, you literally worked all night there. It was incredibly hard work. But, yeah. Um, but then eventually, after another year or so, uh, during that time while I was working there, that's when Warren and I got married in 96. Um, and then I moved eventually to my dream job. I got a job, I, again, another job came up, I think in the paper at CBBC. And my first, and I managed to get the job I always wanted, which was children's television. Yes. What was uh, it about children's television that so appealed to you? I don't know, is the honest truth. I think I, I, it kind of went alongside my, I was very involved in youth work and I, I always, I've lo always loved working with children and, you know, I still do children's service at Sean. It's still one of my favourite things. I love being with kids. I, you know, probably possibly an alternative career. I could have probably been a teacher. I don't know. I, I like kids. I like relating to kids. I just like the fun of, you know, I was never cut out to be a serious journalist. You know, I, I like fun. I like creativity. And I, we always used to say when I worked at CBBC, it's the most demanding audience. I mean, if you can't, to explain things to kids, to make things fun for kids, you've got to be very creative and you've got to make things clear and simple. Yeah. Um, so I really loved it. So I was very lucky to kind of get where I always wanted to be. Yes. <laughs> and you're on Blue, you moved to, as a producer then to Blue Peter. Yeah, so I started at a show called Short Change, which was like a kind of uh, a bit like Watchdog for kids. Mm. Then I eventually moved to Record Breakers, which was really good fun as well. Uh, and then um, while I was there, we'll talk about children obviously in a minute, but that's when I discovered, I remember being a very late night edit on Record Breakers and feeling really sick and I didn't know why. And that's when I discovered I was pregnant with Nathan. Um, and then um, then I did go on eventually to get a job as a producer on Blue Peter, which you mentioned. I was there also for the launch of when children's television went to digital to the CBBC channel. And that was quite an exciting time in, in children's television. It was the first digital channel. You know, it, was all, it was all quite an exciting time to be there. Yes. But Blue Peter, obviously, I think there's something about working on a flagship show. You know, everybody knows Blue Peter and it opens doors. So you would call up. And if you were calling from Blue Peter, people said yes, normally. Yes. You know, we, we had the prime minister on the show. We we did all kinds of things. You know, we, we it was you, you only ever had the best on Blue Peter, the top of someone at the top of their game. Yes. Um, so where, where, where does it how do you get the Blue Peter badge then? How do you how did you earn that? Uh, well, I mind a little sneaky one actually because I got it um while I was there I think towards the end of my time at Blue Peter it was their 50th birthday and I had a special party at the Natural History Museum and everybody got a special tribute 50 year badge but what people don't know is it's actually really easy to get a Blue Peter badge you just have to send a letter they're very any child that writes to Blue Peter gets a badge so all my kids have got badges obviously I mean but I used to tell all my friends then just send a letter send a picture anything you, they write back to every single child and you get a badge if you write in so for those of you with kids tell them them. You've certainly taken us on a real a damn memory lane for all those old programmes that, that <laughs> ring a bell. And you also came into contact at that time, was it when you met David Beckham? That seems to be... Yes. Yeah, Beth mentioned put that in the trail. Obviously when yes, that's why I was wondering. Well, we hadn't mentioned it, but Beth had put it in, yeah. so let's hear about it. So I think I picked out, I mean, the other highlight is what we'll come to when we talk about the music, but there were two things that had really stood out for me at my time at Big Beach. And, this, the story about David Beckham is one is that it wasn't even about meeting David Beckham actually because I was lucky enough at the big breakfast and at Blue Peter you, we did meet a lot of celebrities so that's that almost wasn't the exciting thing what I was really excited about is um on Blue Peter when, when you kind of achieve something special you get a gold badge so we decided we were giving David Beckham a gold badge he it was you know he looked at the peak of his career he was opening his own football academy at that time somewhere in the East End I think and it was on the site of the what's now the Millennium Dome. Anyway, whatever. He opened a football academy. And for some reason, we were giving him the gold badge. But I think for whatever reason, we were turning this around very quickly and wanted it on that day's show. So I went with the presenter um, and we presented him. We made the film. We gave him the badge. He was absolutely charming. Well, I always like a celebrity who, when they come in the room, they he doesn't they don't, they don't assume that you everyone knows who they are. He came, hello, I'm David. He shook oh. my hand. I was like, oh, really? I would never have known. But, you know, he's absolutely lovely. Um, and we gave him his gold badge. And then what the most exciting thing was they had waiting for me from Blue Peter a uh, motorbike taxi. And I had to jump on this motorbike, get back all the way back to West London to TV Centre. I think the interview was about one o'clock. 
and I had to get back and edit the piece and have it ready for broadcast for that day at 4.30. And it, you know, it was obviously a real buzz and very exciting. Excitement. What excitement. You must have been very popular afterwards with <laughs> lots of people and the family especially. Now, <clears throat> would you like to tell us about your next piece of music? What, and why so, you've chosen it? So one of the last things I did at Blue Peter before I left was um, I was asked <laughs> to do um, the Blue Peter prom. So every year at the proms, and the very well-known BBC proms at the Royal Albert Hall, there was always a children's prom that Blue Peter fronted. Um, and the year I did it, um, they asked me to produce it as I was kind of leaving Blue Peter that year. So it was my, my, my kind of farewell. And it was also the presenter Matt Baker's leaving show. So it was a very big event and it was really amazing to work on. I was working with the BBC um, Philharmonic Orchestra and all the people from the proms. And we put together this whole show all about um, children's music. And it was all themed around animals. It was a Blue Peter safari, I think it was themed. I actually looked up the, the programme to, in research for this to see, to choose a song. And funny enough, none of the songs, although I remember the event and it was very important to me, none of the songs particularly kind of resonated with me. But the theme was children's classical music and animals. And there is a song that my mum will know this. Growing up, we had the record of Peter and the Wolf. Yes. Prokofiev. 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 Prokofiev, thank you. <laughs> um, and my mum knows when we used to listen to it when we were children, um, it's a, the narrator tells the story of Peter and the Wolf and he uses all the different classical instruments to teach you about the orchestra. And I used to pretend to be Peter and our poor dog Sandy was the wolf. And basically from, I was probably about three or four, I don't know, maybe a bit older, but from that age, I was already kind of producing in my head, my own TV shows basically. Mm -hmm. So although this, this song itself wasn't part of the Blue Peter prom, I picked it because it just reminds me both of that childhood memory and also this lovely event oh. at, the, at the Royal Albert Hall. Lovely, thanks Karen. Thank you, Paul, for coffee. Yes, Peter and the wolf. Just then, a duck <laughs> came waddling round. She was glad that Peter had not closed the gate and decided to take a nice swim in the, in the deep pond in the meadow. I don't know if you can see, and that I don't went away too quick, but I was going to say there was a little yellow arrow in the corner of that yeah. picture that was pointing at me in the, in the oh, picture. Surrounded by people as ever. Oh, <laughs> that was the big blue Peter tea. They Every year they took a picture of all the team yeah. on the set. That was the picture. Lovely. Thank you. Now we're coming to the last two pieces of music, Karen, and the, and the next one. Uh, we're thinking about the arrival of the children, never mind the um, Peter and the wolf coming. The children arrive. Uh, starting in 2000 with Nathan, who's now 22, and of course Noah in 2002, and Aaron more recently, 2006. Of course, that would have changed things as far as your media career is concerned. And I think at the same time, things changed because so much of the BBC moved up to Manchester, didn't it? So it made life a bit more challenging for you. Yeah, I mean, it did and it didn't. I was always determined to keep working. So Nathan was born, as you said, in 2000. And I left children's television about 2007, I think. So I worked all the way through the kind of early years of them being small. I mean, part I worked part time from the minute they were born. And actually, in that day, it was quite radical. I think I was the first person, I think, to produce Blue Pizza part time, which was challenging. I mean, it was always there were difficult times when you're trying to kind of, you know, manage work and home and do everything. I was very lucky. I had an amazing nanny who was still friends with. I mean, an absolutely gorgeous nanny. And very good family sports. My mom was all, and my dad were always brilliant, looking after the kids and helping with the kids. Um, so it didn't, it didn't stop me from working, but it definitely changed things. Like you definitely have to think differently when you've got kids. And you know, from the minute they were born, it then became a, a juggle, I guess, between my. You know, they are very much my priority, and I'm mm -hmm. 
I, um, I'm very proud of everything I've achieved, but if I'm really honest, probably my kids are the thing I'm most proud of, like, like all Jewish moms, obviously, you know, I adore my children. I know we all adore our children, but there is nothing I love more than being with, with my family. And when all five, are, when we're all five together, I'm at my happiest when we're all here together. Oh, isn't that lovely? And of course, you have to manage now because two of them aren't with you all the time. And especially at the moment, it's been more challenging, hasn't it? But I suppose that's why you treasure your holidays with them in Israel and the time you spend there together. That's great. Sure. Um, do you want to tell us about this next piece of music? Huh? Yeah. So, as, children? as I kind of alluded to, you know, we, we love family time. We, we love, we're very lucky. We travel a lot. We've done some, we've been to some amazing places. We've been to Sri Lanka together. In fact, 20 of us went to Sri Lanka, all my family, my brothers, my parents. We've been to Africa. You know, we love to travel, but we also love to, uh, just kind of down to earth camping in England. We do a lot of camping. And one thing that's particularly we treasure as a family is festivals. Um, we love music and we love dancing. Um, and the song I've chosen next is reminds me of a festival we went to when the children were quite young called Camp Festival. Um, and I've got a memory of being at this festival. Noah, I think one of the pictures you see is Noah dressed as a mouse. She spent the whole weekend dressed as a mouse. Um, they, you know, face paints all weekend. Um, it's just totally free for kids at a festival. They can, you know, run around. They were, we were with other friends, but they can just be free, love the music. And the song I've chosen is Mad Madness played at this festival. I do, I've always loved the music of Madness. Yeah. They, played, they played live. And as the, the, they came on in the evening and the sun's setting over the stage, I think Noah had fallen asleep in Aaron's buggy for some reason. But as this song came on, it was Madness, it must be love. She gets up, we're all dancing our little hearts out and we just had the most beautiful evening that I'll always remember. Sounds magical. Thank you, Paul. Madness, it must be love. <laughs> I've been to a music festival, which I haven't mm -hmm. been before, and oh. Bougain, with Bougainvillea to boot at the end. Now we're coming, coming to our last piece of music, and um, we're thinking about 2012, when you were enjoying a lovely summer and the excitement of the Olympics. And then suddenly during that summer, Karen, you get the very sudden and shocking diagnosis of um, breast cancer. At your age then, I think you were 41, weren't you? So it really was very young. And, and you were obviously, nothing could prepare you for this. And we've talked about how this, is, this experience has affected you. And of course, it's something that might make you emotional, which inevitably it would. But it's still a very important part of you when you think back to it, and probably part of you now as well. Would you like to say a bit about it? Yeah, I think you, you almost touched on this, I think, early on when you said I'd always been quite comfortable. I think I'd been really lucky in my life until I was 41. You know, I'd only had joy and happiness and love and good things. Mm. 
um I will find this a bit difficult, but I'm fine. I am fine. I wanted to talk about it. Absolutely. Um, you know, it was a shock, but because I am literally the most optimistic person in the universe, I'm probably the only person in the world that would find a lump. And I went to the doctor and she said to me, oh, it's, it's nothing. It's probably just a swelling. It's an infection. And luckily, my mother is the least optimistic person in the world. And she said, no, you need to get another opinion. You need to you need to see a specialist. Um, so I went to see a, a cancer special, a breast cancer specialist, and even then, I'm, again, I'm probably the only person in the world that goes for a mammogram. I'm chatting away to the mammogram lady, very relaxed. Didn't even occur to me that anything was wrong. Um, and then the doctor said to me when I went back to see the the consultant, he said to me, "I'm I'm very worried. I'm I'm concerned." And then I, that was kind of the first point when it sort of hit me that this actually could be something a bit serious. Mm. Uh, and I'd gone on my own because it didn't even occur to me that that was that it was going to be bad news. I'd gone all on my own to this appointment. But he said, come back on Friday and we'll, we'll, find, we'll let you know what's going on. And obviously I took Warren with me when I went back. And that's when he said, I'm, I'm sorry, it is cancerous. Yeah. Um, but I'll never forget his words. He said to me, um, he said, you know, you're going to have a really difficult six months and then you're going to be absolutely fine. I promise you, you're going to be fine. And I, that stayed with me the whole way through. You know, I did know I was going to be OK, thank God. Mm -hmm. And I was and I am. You know, it's now many years on and I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm well, thank God. But. Thank but it was, a, it was a hard six months. It ago. was a hard time and it was rigorous treatment as well, wasn't it? And of course, you at the end of your treatment, I think, was it, um, you had a bar mitzvah at the end, didn't you? Yeah. So yeah. I remember also, you know, I had an operation, I had chemotherapy, I had radiotherapy, you know, it wasn't easy. Um, and I remember going to one of the appointments with my mum and the doctor said to me, you're going to lose your hair, you're going to lose your eyebrows, you're going to probably lose your fingernails. I remember saying to my mom, I literally remember bursting into saying, I can't, I've got a permit for in May. You know, that's what I remember thinking, like, how am I going to do this? Um, but um, my treatments all finished around April and Nathan's permit was in May. And actually, to be honest, you know, we got there, we got through it. And it was such an amazing way to finish everything, you know, to celebrate with all, everybody we loved. Yeah. I didn't have very much hair. I think you'll see in the pictures in a minute. But Liz, actually, my dear friend Liz, who's on the call, I asked to come on the call today because she is my very dearest friend. She's in Israel. I remember she, she said to me in one of her messages, she said, nobody cares what you're wearing, whether you've got any fingernails, whether your hair looks nice. All that anyone cares about is that your beautiful son is, is having a bit. And I remember that's, that really stuck with me. And that, that is what it was about. You know, it was about Nathan's day and that we'd all got through it. You know, what got me through that time was my friends and family. They were incredible. Um, oh, well, you know, that, and that's what we celebrated at the end of it. And I'm sure they were so glad to be able to support you and help you. And your optimism, as we've talked about, really helped you through, didn't it? And continues to do so, to face that. So yeah, definitely. Something you look back on now, thank goodness. Thank goodness, I am well. And, you know, I had, I had a lot of help through it all. And I'm, yeah. you know, I would say the one thing that I've always said to people now when they unfortunately have that diagnosis, I always say to people, you know, take whatever help you're offered. People want to help. And everyone, you know, my cousin Lisa, within an hour or whatever of my diagnosis, had already arranged a food rota. It, lots of people on this call now were bringing me food every day and mm -hmm. the rabbi was amazing everybody was was amazing through that period and just got us through it and yes. we're here now yeah, oh fine. good for you good for you so now you've got a special piece of music when you think about that is it um, is it connected with that time it's kind of not so much with that time actually the last piece of music I wanted to have something kind of optimistic I didn't want to really end on that no obviously I don't really pick something particularly so much about that but it's more about my optimism and I think we finished that year with Nathan's Mitzvah and then we went to Israel that summer. And I just remember it just felt such a tonic like, to be with close friends, to be in Israel, mm. to be somewhere we love. And, you know, we, we're very lucky. We've got a lot of family in Israel and a lot of friends. And it's very kind of, it's important to us. It's part of, of the story. Um, and the song I picked to finish with was as a, a song by someone called David Brozza, who's an Israeli singer, very, 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 very well known in Israel. Mm. Um, and the song itself is almost the spirit that I wanted. It's called Yehia Tov which means it will be good, everything will be fine. And the song, he wrote it during all the wars in Israel. And, you know, it's a difficult country, Israel, obviously. There's a lot to worry about, you know, and, but he could still write this really optimistic song that's kind of, he, and one of the lines he says, I've got it here, she says, you know, I'm, I'm still here, all will be good. I sometimes break down, but on this night, I'm going to stay with you and we'll learn to live together. And it's just positive and hopeful. And it's all about tomorrow is going to be better. And that's kind of my, my motto. inspiration in life. Your motto says it all for you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. David Broza, you're here, Tom. I am a bit of a challenge, and this is what I do. 
Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for sharing that with us and sharing your optimism with us. Really, we all need a dose of it. Now, before we cast you away, you know the format. You're entitled to take one luxury item, mm -hmm. a book apart from Shakespeare and the Bible, and you choose one piece of music. Let's start with your luxury item. What will you choose? Okay. So one thing we haven't really talked about is I love food. I absolutely love food. I love cooking. And I love food. So I've chosen as my book to take Evelyn Rose's International Jewish Cookbook that my mum gave me a copy of 30 years ago, probably. And it's the most ragged, dirty, it's got stains all over it. But I absolutely love it. It's got loads of our favourite recipes in it. And I've never properly read it to her because Evelyn Rose tells lots of stories in the book. So it'll give me a chance to properly read all her stories and lots of recipes that I can dream about when I'm eating coconuts or whatever on my island. Thing. about all the ones you didn't make and you could have made exactly that's my book <laughs> <laughs> then um the luxury item um well i've had to choose I'm, I'm being a bit naughty a bit cheeky but i couldn't bear to be all that time without my family and also i'm not very good at doing nothing i need to be entertained so i'm going to take an ipad i know i can't have any internet but i'm going to have lots of pictures of my family all the lovely pictures of everybody um, and lots of brain games that I can play on my iPad, so I can play Sudoku and whatever, keep my brain busy while I can't talk to anybody. Well, <laughs> Lauren might say no, but I'll say yes. Oh, thank you. And your last song, what would you like to choose? Of Not your last song, I should say, yeah. which song would you like from the eight that you've chosen? Well, that's very hard, but I think if I had to just pick one, I think I would take the Van Morrison, Have I Told You Lately That I Love You? Because it will just remind me of Warren and the family and oh. keep me happy. <laughs> oh, it's been a lovely way of hearing more about you Karen learning more about you learning about your family your priorities your values and as I say your great approach to life so thank you so much don't go away to death and we'll miss you too much thank oh. you for sharing your oh thank you thank you for interviewing me so beautifully you've asked such lovely questions I'm happy for me we had a lovely chat so thank you <laughs> thank you, Karen. And thank you, everybody, for. I don't know where they all are. Maybe we'll see a few faces now. Yeah, we can go back to see everybody. Maybe. Yes, maybe. Oh, thank you. There we are. Thank you. Karen. Thank you. Well done. Did a good we're, job. we're allowed to unmute everyone at the end. I see everybody now. But shall we? Can we? I can't get anybody on gallery. Beth, are we allowed to unmute everyone now at the end? Except to Beth, I don't know. <laughs> I think she's trying. It looks like she's trying. But... Anyway, well, if we can't unmute. 
No, the host isn't allowing it. Paul, you might have to do it. Yeah. You can unmute yourself, oh, maybe. Uh, there we are. We're all unmuted now. Well done, Sheila. Yes. Yeah. Well done, you. Well done. Uh, what was the point? Oh, yes. no, well done, Paul. Thank you, Sheila and Karen. <laughs> we should say thank you to Paul for all the technical work. Well done, well done Sheila. It was fabulous. <laughs> fabulous evening. Wonderful. Thanks, Karen. It was very enjoyable. <laughs> fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. Lovely, lovely interview. Thank you. That was lovely. Very moving. Don't flick through. Well, thank you, Karen and Sheila. No no very interesting. Oh, good. My sister in law just reminded me that I should have told the story about the fact that Warren's nose got broken at Nathan's Bar Mitzvah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, remember I remember that. that. I think there was enough going on at Nathan's Bar Mitzvah, wasn't there? Yeah, it? and amongst everything, poor Warren's nose was broken that night in one of the in one of the raucous dances. Huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was my it was my two nephews that did it. it was, Where is he? Oh, there he is. It was the yeah. two nephews that broke my nose. Oh, right. <laughs> it was Steve's boys, right? <laughs> my Steve's boy yeah. and Neil's boy. Luckily, one of our good friends is a doctor, and I said to him, quick, come and have a look at Warren. And he looks at Warren, another schnapp friend, by the way, my friend Simon. He looks at Warren, he said, Warren, you sure know it's normally on the side? <laughs> he said, I think it's broken. So Warren said, what should I do? He said, drink a lot of whiskey. <laughs> that, that's what he did. I'm glad everybody's heard the story now, Karen. I'm glad they've all heard it. Yeah, that, was like the, that was like the bonus cut, the director's cut. You get an extra story at the end. <laughs> Anybody that isn't here tonight is at the whiskey club. Oh. So they're looking forward to the recording. So that